Okay, I I will speak. So welcome to 3D Geometry and Vision Seminar Series. Today's speaker is Georgian Wu from Stanford University, and we also have panelist uh, Sudan from Colombia. Do you want to say hi? Hi, hello everyone. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I want to give a brief introduction. So Georgian is an assistant professor uh, at Stanford, uh, working on computer vision, machine learning. Computer graphics, computer like uh, uh, cognitive sciences, right? So before joining Stanford, he was a visiting faculty researcher at Google Research. So he received his PhD in EECS at MIT. Jordan's research has been recognized through a uh, uh, ACM uh, doctoral dissertation award um, and many, 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 many other awards. Okay, many, many and many, many fellowships. Okay. <laughs> oh, so uh, today uh, he will talk about surfaces, objects, procedures, integrating learning and the graphics for 3D seeing and understanding. So welcome, Jiaojun. Okay, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Chixing. Uh, very nice to be here. Um, also, thank you for organizing the series of uh, talks. I think it is great events. And thank you, Shuran, and I think Sid is here as well. So thank you, Shuran, Sid, for for, for for joining us. Yeah, Sid, do you want to say hi? <laughs> You're yeah, unmuted. Oh, anyway. I think you're muted. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm Sid Chaudhary. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks also uh, the organizers for organizing this. And uh, yeah, over to you. Okay, nice to see you, Sid. Yeah. Okay. Um, so thanks for reminding me. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about you know surfaces, objects, procedures, integrating learning and graphics for 3D C understanding. So 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 the theme of this talk is um, to think about how we may. Um, connect all those deep learning methods that has been very popular and very powerful in C understanding and now more and more in 3D C understanding, but with domain knowledge, especially those constraints or features or representations that we have learned or studied for decades in computer graphics, right? And how to really integrate them to make your learning system uh, more data efficient, more generalizable. Um, so the important representations or features, knowledge we can take from computer graphics, especially include uh, surfaces, objects, and procedures, as we'll see later in the talk. So this is to begin with, uh, this is joint work with many other people, but especially um, the graduate students and undergraduate students, Xiaoming Zhou, Chong Jiayuan, and Ai Kai. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're either PhD, the three of them are PhD students at MIT, and also back when I was a PhD student at MIT, so we collaborated. And Ai Kai is a visiting student at MIT, an undergrad from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. And my advisors, um, back when I was at MIT, Bill Freeman and Josh Tenenbaum, my collaborators at uh, Google Research, Noah Snavely, and Jun Yan, who, is, uh, who was a postdoc at MIT, uh, did, got his uh, PhD at Berkeley, and now is a system professor at CMU, as well as a support team from many uh, sponsors. Okay, C understanding. We want to connect learning and computer graphics for 3D C understanding. But when we say we want to solve the problem or study the problem of C understanding, what does that include? What does that mean? So given a scene like this, right, there's a, there were a number of cars, there, were, there, was, there are trees, there is roads, and we can easily answer questions like how many cars are there in, in the scene? So we recognize the, and recognize the objects, but we also understand that objects have features you know, like cars has their position, it has the color, so we can answer what's the color of the closest car. And we also understand that objects are not only 2D, like a segment, but cars have their 3D geometry. So we can imagine how would the car look like from the front. And the scene is not static, right? It looks like the person who took this picture is also in a car and I can easily predict what's going to happen. It looks like I'm moving forward, so I can predict the other cars are probably also going to move forward. And there are three C parameters. Um, so it looks like a cloudy or sunny, hard to tell, but, but during the day. So, but what if it's rainy, it's how the scene look like? Our ability to understand objects and understand scenes not only applies to uh, common objects like cars or trees, but also we can easily generalize uh, to new objects. Like these are a pile of some, a combination of familiar and unfamiliar objects. And I can, uh, you know, I, I believe everyone can um, pretty easily understand their, you know, what they are, the geometry, and you can imagine their physical properties. So our ability to understand scenes also applies to objects we have, we've maybe even never seen before, the novel objects. So we want to build 
computer system to replicate such abilities? And how can we really have a machine that can also understand and answer all these questions? So to begin with, let's look at a simplified or easier problem or connecting more to 3D vision. That is, if, I have, if I'm given a single 2D image, color image, how can I really infer the 3D geometry of the object if I assume there's only one object at the center of the image? Right. Um, the forward direction, if I'm already given this 3D shape and the texture and lighting and, and poses, I can you know, do rendering, right? So important subject in computer graphics. Graphics can take that 3D shape and textures and scene parameters and produce a beautiful picture like this. And um, the other direction, right? Going from the 2D image to the 3D shape is an um, important subject in computer vision. And that's why I think in some sense, right? Sometimes people call vision as inverse graphics. And classic, if you look at classic literature, there are a lot of research on shape from X, but probably more recently when people talk about vision, uh, they often refer to some just very complicated deep net networks. You just use deep learning and collect a lot of data and then send it into a deep network and magically you just get, get whatever you want, like the 3D geometry of the object. For example, if you can get a lot of data. But as we said at the beginning, we want to understand if there's any knowledge that we can take from the computer graphics rendering pipeline especially, and to connect them with deep learning systems to make them work better, will be more data efficient and maybe more generalizable. So to better understand it, let's just take a deeper look into the forward process, the image formation process. Uh, here is a, a much simplified setup. If we're given this 3D geometry, uh, you know, we can imagine an image as produced as you put a 3D shape in a 3D space. There's a light source which send rays to the object and uh, the rays hits the object and get reflected to the camera. In front of the camera, there is an image plane. So you're essentially seeing an object from the image plane. And if you think deeper, right, what you're really seeing from this picture, you realize you're not seeing the full 3D geometry. For example, um, the shape, uh, uh, the object has, the chair has four legs and we can easily imagine that. But from the picture, you're only seeing the three legs of the object, right? You're essentially seeing the visible surface of the object. And the, the fact that you understand chairs has four legs and if you want to reconstruct the geometry, you want to put four legs, it's not coming from the visible information or from the visual observation, but instead from a prior knowledge, from a, from a knowledge that chairs must be stable and chairs must have four legs. So accordingly, maybe we can design an inversion system, try to estimate shapes, but instead of doing an end-to-end -end deep learning system, we can do it in two steps. The first step is to estimate the depth map. You can see the depth map as a reparameterization of the visible surfaces, right? Every point, every pixel on the depth map uh, corresponds to a point on the visible surface. And the second step is to going from the visible surface or depth map to complete the 3D geometry doing shape completion. And the second step, you're not using any knowledge from the picture itself. You're using the prior knowledge that you have learned, for example, from synthetic data or from large data sets of 3D CAT models. And you can see the depth map really captures all the information you can know about object geometry from the input RGB image. And in that sense, you can, uh, one way to put it is by conditioning on the depth map, the input color image and the output 3D shape becomes conditionally independent. So this really justifies why we may want such an intermediate representations like that lab instead of using other representations. Okay, so if we design a system like this in two steps, the first step doing depth estimation, the second doing shape completion, and we can train it, for example, on you know, large shape databases like ShapeNet, you can randomly uh, pick objects from ShapeNet and uh, randomly rotate them, put them in front of random backgrounds and you can render the pictures, right? So you can use them, uh, use these synthetic data uh, to train such a system. And then you can test it on real data. So this, these are results from uh, on the Pascal 3D plus data set. So it is actually images of real chairs. And you can see these chairs are not as common actually. So they are not most common chairs. And this is what you can get if you just have an entry and deep networks, you know, taking the input image and output a 3D shape directly without modeling depth. And just by modeling depth as an intermediate representations, you can see the network output are just not now much more accurate. And it is also really focusing more on important features such as object surfaces, which, it, it, which are really what matter to us when we were seeing or when we, were, we want to reconstruct a 3D geometry object from the image. And here are a few more examples, right? Just by uh, 
modeling depth, this very simple change uh, by having depth of intermediate representations, the output is becoming much more accurate and getting more details. So this is joint work uh, actually now a few years back uh, with Yi Fan Wang, who is now a PhD student at University of, University of uh, Washington. Okay, so at the beginning we talked about uh, we want to, our ability to understand scenes, understand geometry of the object, not only applies to objects that we've seen before, but we also really care, we can, we can do that for novel objects, but how would this model generalize to unseen object classes? So we just did a quick test. If we want to take the model and we train it on chairs, planes, and cars, and these are like the three largest object categories in shape data. Right? So these are you know, probably the most common object categories that you can get the most number of uh, cat models for. And then you test it on the table. Table is like the fourth largest object category, also pretty common. If you send this test image of a table to a network, and this is what you're going to get. Right, so these are actually the output of direct prediction method. Uh, even with the depth or whatever as an intermediate representations, the output doesn't look that much like a table. It looks much more like an airplane. And the reason that the system is doing that is the system is like, Okay, I've never seen this image. I don't know what that is. So, but you know, during training, I've seen chairs, planes, and cars. And the top of the input image, the top of the table, is round and thin, and does look like some of the airplanes I've seen before. So I just try to smartly retrieve a nearest neighbor shape from the training set that is an airplane and just produce it. So this shows the system not doesn't really learn knowledge about object geometry for completion, but instead it's just doing very smart nearest neighbor retrieval. And this is not only a problem for our approach, but you know the field of single view 3D shape estimation has been very popular in the past few years. And there are people coming up with all those approaches uh, using point clouds as representations or depth map, point clouds or multi view images or voxels or a collection of surfaces. And they all have this kind of issue. Uh, so for people who are interested, right, there's a paper from CVPR 2019 uh, called What Do Single View 3D Reconstruction Networks Learn, where they analyze this problem in detail. Okay, so how can we really do better uh, to make the system uh, really generalized to objects that you've never seen before? Okay, so we said we want to uh, take knowledge from a graphics engine from a rendering pipeline. Um, so let's take a deeper look into the system and see how we are doing in inverting the graphics engine. And if we let's take a deeper look into the second step, right, which takes a depth map and output a 3D shape, uh, the shape completion network. So we're saying we hope the system in the second step really focus on doing shape completion. Uh, but instead, uh, you know, the depth map is still again a 2D representations. And Essentially what the system is doing in the second step is it's trying to project depth into 3D, right? Because you're taking the 3D, 2D representation of depth map and try to output in 3D shape. So you're still implicitly learning to project depth into 3D, like into this partial visible surface, and then trying to complete it in 3D. On the other hand, you know, projecting depth into 3D is a, is a deterministic and fully differential process, right? We've studied that it's perspective projection. We can write down the equations and it's fully differentiable. If this is something that's universal, deterministic and fully differentiable, why do we have the system to relearn it? And instead, you know, we should, we should try to avoid having the system to be over parameterized and learning this deterministic mapping. But instead, what if we just build this deterministic mapping into the system? Right, so now the pipeline becomes we first estimate, estimate the depth, and then we back project the estimated depth map into a partial surface in 3D. As you can see now here in the visualization, it's not in 3D, but again, it's a partial surface. So you're not seeing the back of the chair, you're not seeing the missing fourth neck. But then the second part of the model can really focus on completing the shape just by you know, taking a partial surface in 3D and outputting a full um, completed uh, geometry in 3D. So then now if we take these models and again train it on chairs, planes, and cars and test it on this table image, this is what you get before with direct prediction. And this is what you get by modeling not only depth, but also the back projection model. So here we are taking an intermediate representation surface or depth map from computer graphics. We're also taking you know, how geometry works, the 3D to 2D projection, but we build it into the system and use it as a deterministic differentiable back projection module, although with no learnable parameters. It, it does look much better. 
looks much more like your table, but still, if you look at the top of the reconstructed table, then you find that it has, it's pretty bumpy, right? You have all the bumpiness or roughness that we don't really expect uh, in, in such kind of a reconstruction of man-made objects because we have a prior that the top of the table should be pretty smooth. Um, this is because while the network is actually doing uh, the reconstructions in 3D, you know, partial surface in 3D is, is actually extremely sparse, right? And if you're representing uh, the, the shape in, in such like a volumetric representations, then it's hard for the completion network to capture surface features in 3D, uh, and much of the representation power is actually wasted in empty spaces. And here's an example, but this is not too bad, but here's another example of a reconstructed chair. And this is the output. So from the interview, it does look like it's, it's okay. But if you actually rotate it, then you can see that the completion network is, is trying to do something. It does understand, you know, there, there's the other side of the chair, the shape must be connected and complete, but it doesn't have the ability to actually produce a smooth shape, a smooth surface. So our solution is to let the network really focusing more on getting the surface right by using a spherical representation. So, so we, we use a spherical map as a surrogate representation for, for surfaces in 3D. So what is a spherical map? You take this partial surface and you put it into a unit sphere. And then you can sample uh, points on the surface of the sphere. And then from those points, you send the rays to the center of the sphere and you record the first time that each ray hits the object. You know, if you parameterize the, the rays or the points using azimuth and elevation, like a UV mapping, then this is what you can get as a spherical map representation, right? So every pixel on a spherical map uh, represents the distance that the ray travels until it hits the surface of object. And this is a, this representation in a spherical map, it really focuses more on the surface because every pixel in this spherical map is actually corresponding again to the point on, on on the surface of the, of the object geometry. So now putting it into the system, we're now having this input image and first estimated depth. And then we project it instead of to a partial 3D surface in a volumetric representations, you project it back into a partial spherical map. And then now the system becomes, you first estimate the depth and then you project it into a partial spherical map. And then you do the completion, but in the in the representation or in the space of the spherical maps. So you're going from a partial spherical map to a full spherical map and the problem essentially becomes a 2D image in painting problem. Um, but then as spherical map only represents the first time every ray hits the object, right? So you can see there's a lot of self occlusion going on. Um, so if you back project it back uh, into, the 3D in, into the 3D space, then you see the shape is roughly complete, but due to self occlusion, there are some details that are missing. So we have a final network uh, for fine tuning just to get the details right. Okay, so now this becomes the whole system. And if we again test it on the same uh, image of the table, uh, this is what you get. This is what you get with uh, direct prediction and without spherical map. Uh, but, and finally, this is what you get with spherical maps. It's, if, especially if you compare the top of the surface, you can see that by having this spherical map representations, it really gives you a much smoother output. Uh, and getting the surface to be much smoother. And this is the main idea uh, behind our system called generalizable reconstruction uh, in Europe's 2018. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning, our joint work with especially Zhou Tong and Xiu Ming, who are uh, PhD students at MIT, they really contributed the most significantly to this, to this work. Okay. Um, so we want to generalize your NSYNC classes. We test it on the table and then we try, we want to try more. So we want to now test it on a bookshelf and a sofa. Again, everything here is just trained on chairs, planes, and cars. And here's the baseline at testnet, which uh, does really well on the training categories. And even for these out of sample uh, object categories, they're trying their best to approximate it. it it's, it's not like totally unreasonable. Um, but if we compare that with our approach, then we can see that we do capture more details and aligns with the input image much better. And when we are generalizing to unseen object classes, and here are some, uh, here's the ground truth for comparison. Let's look at this sofa, right? The back of the sofa is completely missing, uh, but how will our system be able to actually complete it? So if we want to complete the back of the sofa, we, we can actually, uh, we just try to visualize the spherical maps to understand what's really going on. So in the input view, right, because the back of the sofa is not visible. So in the spherical map, it may become the missing values. And then after sending them into 
uh, the spherical impinging network, so you're, which tries to complete this partial or single view spherical map into a full or omni view spherical map. Uh, then you can see the impinging actually allows the system to complete the back of the shape and the soft, and also imprinting in, uh, ensures the, the completed shape to be, to be smooth. Here are some more examples on generalizing to beds, uh, tables, and benches. And you can see that the baselines are mostly trying to approximate uh, the, the input image or the geometry of the input image with uh, the nearest neighbors like airplanes or chairs. And here's our reconstruction, which still a lot of imperfections um, and all those you know, bumpinesses or details missing are inaccurate, but it does capture you know, some interesting features. And again, uh, all from a single image and without seeing any of these, like any of the any benches or any of the tables, by only train on uh, chairs, planes, and cars, right? Including also the lack of the of the bench. And here are the ground truth for comparison. And we also tested something that's you know even uh, even harder. Um, so what if we just try to test the model, train on chairs, planes, and cars, but on non-rigid objects like humans and horses? And here is the model's reconstruction. If you compare them with um, the ground truth then you can still see all those imperfections, the bumpinesses and the things that are not accurate. Um, but um, it's quite impressive that without seeing any, uh, any humans or horses right, or any deformable objects, uh, the system still, at least they learn, I should, I should try to complete shape to, to make it smooth and to make it complete um, and give you something that is reasonable compared with the watchers. Okay, so this is a, a to me, I feel like this is an example of how we can use intermediate representations and knowledge from computer graphics, especially the representation of surfaces and projections, 2D to 3D, 3D to 2D projections, and build them as intermediate representations in the learning system to make the system not only do better, but also most importantly, generalize to new object classes, right? So, so the notion of surfaces, you know, when, when David Marr were developing his theory of human perception, uh, which I think people now have a lot of debate on it, but an important concept that he introduced is, is um, the two and happy surfaces, which he believes serves as, a, as an intermediate representation for human perception. Um, but I, I guess here, we're not trying to argue whether it's an important part of human perception or not, but we does show by modeling things that are pretty universal, like surfaces can actually make your machine perception system to do better and to be more generalizable. So this is the, uh, the, the inver, inver, inverse, uh, so inverse graphics direction. Uh, but the other direction, we can also try to think about how we may use intermediate representations like surfaces to make the graphics direction, rendering direction do a little better or do something that they cannot do before. In particular, you know, if we take a classic rendering engine, we can get an object geometry. If we know what object geometry and texture are and lightings are, we can synthesize beautiful pictures. But what if we want to generalize or synthesize objects I've never seen before, or textures I've never seen before, right? So for shape and texture synthesis, uh, back in 2016, together with Chen Kai, who was an uh, undergrad and master student at MIT back then, uh, we extended you know, the generative adversary network to 3D uh, so that you can synthesize not only 2D images and 3D shapes. Uh, but later when Jun Yan came to MIT back in 2018, and together with Jun Yan and Zhou Chong as well, uh, so we thought, okay, if we can use intermediate representations like surfaces and projections for inversion, can we also do it in the forward direction, right? So now we again have this differentiable projection model, but we do it, we use it in a different direction. That is, we take this produced 3D shape and we send it into the differentiable projection model, which outputs a two and a half D surface, like depth and silhouette. And then we can do everything in 2D by uh, using things like a cycle game uh, to add textures on these output uh, predicted depths and silhouettes so that you can paint uh, those objects so that you can not only get 3D shapes of chairs, but also 2D images of these chairs in the same viewpoints. Right. So in some sense, you can see this as a hybrid graphics engine. That is, you take elements, again, surfaces, projections from computer graphics, uh, but then you are, so the middle part is, you know, differentiable, but with no learnable parameters. Again, but it's parameterized by the shape and the viewpoint. But the things that you're you're trying to learn is the distribution of possible shapes and condition on that, you know, C to add or the projected uh, view of the object, what's the possible conditional distribution of possible textures. And this allows you to do things that you cannot really do easily with a traditional graphics engine, that is to synthesize novel objects with, or synthesizing objects, but with novel textures. 
And such a disentangled representation, just like in graphics, and you control the shape and texture and viewpoint. Here you also have a disentangled representations for texture, viewpoint, and shape. So you can use it for editing. For example, I can keep the shape and textures and just change the viewpoint of the object. I can see the objects in different viewpoints, or I can just change in their shape uh, by keeping the others, or I can change in their texture. I can do that for things like chairs, but also cars. I can do interpolation, but only in, for example, the space of shape, so that I'm keeping the texture and the viewpoint, but I just want to interpolate between two shapes. And I can generate non 3D shapes, but also their, their corresponding to the images. Right, the same as well for interpreting textures, or you can try to do both. You can interpolate between two objects with the same viewpoint, but different shape and texture and see how it, how it changes. You can also transfer shape and texture. For example, if I'm synthesizing some beautiful cars and then I say, okay, this, I, have a, I have a picture of a car from Google image search, which look extremely nice. I just want to imagine, okay, how the texture of the car will look like if it's applied to a different shape, like those, like those I synthesized. And these are examples where the results you can get. This also makes training much easier because I think a big, a, a very big challenge in 3D vision is always like it's hard to acquire large data sets, right? Especially, I think it's almost impossible to acquire very high quality uh, data sets of 3D geometries of real objects together with high quality textures. But having such kind of a disentangled representation by combining learning and graphics allows you to train the 3D part, like 3D GANs, on pure 3D data sets like ShapeNet. And you can train the 2D part, image translation part, on things like Google Image Search, which gives you a lot of images of 2D cars, but they don't have 3D shapes. But that's fine, because now you can train the 3D part on 3D data. You can train the 2D part on 2D data. It allows your system to exploit you know, the much more diverse data sets and to do things that you cannot really do before. Later, I think this is a paper from UK, um, two at all. Uh, they also really try to uh, extend, you know, we were, when we're doing 3D game, we're like oh, starting with voxel representations, but it has all those limitations that we said before, right? A lot of uh, representation powers are wa wasted. There are aliasings and there's subject to resolutions, really hard to scale up. So they still have this um, volumetric representations in their system, they call it hollow GAN, but instead of representing every voxel as either one or zero, uh, then they have an implicit representation for in, in the voxel grid. Uh, and then they still have the 3D transformation for rotation and projection unit, but instead of representing the you know, voxel as one or zero, they represent it as an implicit vector. And then they're able to do things that are even more challenging, like you know, for indoor scenes, like bedrooms as well, or for faces. Okay, putting things together, right? We can we want to use these intermediate representations like surfaces. Also, you know, we didn't talk too much about it, but everything here is tied to objects, right? We're synthesizing novel objects, we're synthesizing, we're recognizing the geometry of the object. So we want to put them together and see how this intermediate representation can allow us to do not only better inverse graphics, but also forward graphics. And we can connect them, extend them to scenes so that if I'm given image like this, I have a, you know, a picture from Virtual Kitty, I believe, and you have a few cars and then you have you know, the backgrounds like trees. So we can recognize objects, you know, inferring their geometry or their positions, but we can also, you know, assuming we have additional branch for the background for those things that are not as much, you know, that are not that object centric, like trees or skies or roads. What, what if we just do like a background or semantic segmentation? And this gives you uh, semi-interpretable representations of the scene where you have an object centric representations where for every object, you have their 3D geometry, you have their positions and textures. And you can change or edit that image or scene representation saying, okay, I have all these objects, the cars that are at the center, what if I want to move it to the right? Right, so, and then you can send this edited image scene representation back into your, for example, the hybrid graphics engine and to render or re-render how the scene will look like. Again, everything else staying the same. Um, the only thing that has been changed is the position of card, right? So now they're moving to the right, but everything else is the same. Um, so this is joint work with Shen Yu Yao and Harry Xu. I think uh, Shen Yu is a PhD student now at Princeton and Harry is a PhD student at MIT. Okay, so we did some image editing on Virtual Kitty, right? So for images like this, there's a car that is pretty far away. Uh, if I want to you know, make it look uh, larger, if I want to move it closer, how would the scene look like? So we can keep changing the position of the car to make it closer. Imagine how the scene will look like. Uh, for input image like this, I'm saying, okay, what if the, the, the red car is facing a different direction? So I can rotate it, it's synthesizing how the scene will look like. 
or I can also change like the texture, texture or color of the object, uh, or I can change, you know, there's a background, right, a semantic segmentation module. So you, you can also change the global, uh, the weather of the, of the scene. Or because again, we are having this object-centered representations, we understand object have 3D geometry, they have surfaces. So if I ask you uh, in the bottom left picture, what happens if I remove a car uh, in the front? Right, so you should understand that the, the car that was originally occluded also have their full 3D geometry, so it should be complete, right? Instead of you know just doing some pure imaging painting in 2D space, you should have the notion that objects there's there are objects objects have 3D geometries, they have surfaces, and you can use that to you know uh, with your learned graphics model or hybrid graphics model to reconstruct repro, uh, reconstruct a scene or imagine the scene, but with the front object removed, or you can keep doing that and see you know, how the scene will look like. These are on virtual kitty, so the synthetic data set, but you can also try it on real images, uh, like uh, I think these are cityscapes images. So again, given an image, you want to move it, move the car closer to see how the scene will look like. Um, I think the output are, are still pretty reasonable, although uh, you, if you look at more look at look at it, look at them in more detail, then you find some of the uh, actual uh, fine features or fine details have been changed. Uh, Probably because you know real images are much harder to capture uh, those tiny, uh, as a fine-grained uh, distribution of object textures. But in general, the images still look quite realistic. The same as you know rotating how the car will look like uh, to the right, or if there's a car, uh, this is like the input image, uh, the first image I showed in the in the slide in the talk. So I have a car on the left. What happens if I move it to the center? What if I move it to move it closer? What if I further move it to the right? That's how it seems look like. I can do all those very flexible image editing. Okay, so I think this is like a, a brief summary of how we have tried to use notions such as uh, op uh, optics and surfaces and 2D and 3D projections to help us uh, build better uh, vision systems for inverse graphics for 3D object geometry estimation that are more efficient, more more that performs better and also generalizes better, as well as how we can use that to, to help us do to build a augmented graphics rendering pipeline and putting them together for image editing or scene editing. Our notion of object geometry actually goes a little beyond just understanding the surfaces are smooth. Uh, but further, you know, if we look at again these reconstructions on this input image of a table then although our full model genre uh, is doing something that is, okay, I would say more or less reasonable, uh, but if you look at the top of the, of the table, then you find that it is actually smooth now, but still it just doesn't look right. Why is it? Because we humans have a, have a very strong prior that for these man-made objects, artificial objects, uh, like a table, then the top of the table is just most likely to be round instead of this weird, uh, you know, triangular shape. Um, but this is a really hard problem because if you look at a reconstructed object from the input viewpoint, like the pictures on the left, then you find that from the input view, it's already very similar to the input image. Right? So there is not that much signal you can get from the input image to actually get it right. And you have to really rely on even stronger priors that you know, the surfaces are usually, you know, or the objects or the primitives or parts are usually round or they have these abstract representations. So you may want to go beyond from shape reconstruction to shape abstraction to exploit or to capture the fact that especially man-made shapes often have abstract program-like structure. You know, in this table, for example, you can see there are four legs and you have a strong prior that they're identical and their layouts should be you know, on this regular two by two grid. Um, so we actually tried uh, for simple shapes like furnitures like this, we designed a shape domain specific language, a shape DSL, which we try to explain, okay, what these furniture should look like in our language as a domain specific language. And due to time constraint, I'm not gonna talk in detail about this work because I want to talk more about scenes, um, but for shapes, uh, if you try to represent objects, not in these unordered voxels or points, but instead you represent them as, as the program-like representations, like shape programs, then the reconstruction actually looks, uh, at least I would say matches our intuition better because now you have a round uh, top of the table. And this is a joint work with Yonglong Tian, who is a PhD student at MIT. Uh, okay, so uh, this is a quick example of 
beyond objects and surfaces, how such a program-like or procedural representations can help us to really capture the stronger parts that we have in man-made objects. Um, but such kind of rich structure not only exists in just a single object, uh, but there also exists more extensively, I would say, even uh, in 3D scenes, right? So looking at scenes like this, like in corridors or buildings, then what are the structures? Right. We understand there are planes, there are multiple planes, and the planes are really smooth and rectangular. And we understand there are a lot of symmetry, right? So for example, uh, the, there's like, these things are, I would say more like reflectional, reflection, uh, reflectional uh, symmetric, uh, but also there are things that are rotationally symmetric. Um, so as well as there's a lot of repetition going on, right? So you can see the light at the top of the ceiling, they're repeating themselves. And the same on the right, right, in the building or these structures like this, the windows are really repeating themselves. So is that possible for us to exploit these, you know, pretty universal structures like repetition and symmetry so that allow us to do more, or I would say interactive, efficient, flexible design or editing. For example, uh, can we do something like this? Here we took the demo, the, the, GUI from, the GUI from Photoshop, but we actually made the demo ourselves. Okay, so this is not a function, disclaimer not a function offered by Photoshop right now, not yet. Um, but we try to show, you know, this is something that we hope we can achieve. If we can do like interactive segmentation to find objects, and then we can smartly find a vanishing point, and then we can use that, but also exploit the repetitive structure uh, in, the, in the objects like buildings for image editing, right? So to make the building taller or to make it much wider. So in computer graphics, there has been you know, a lot of uh, uh, work in this kind of direction, right? Exploiting procedural models for, for 3D shape generation, especially. You know, things like L systems, you know, you can use, expand uh, things like fractal or recursive structures using very simple, relatively simple rules. That's uh, very impressive. Or things like probabilistic context-free grammars, or, you know, you exploit symmetries for interactive design. Uh, most of these most of these works they're like purely in the three D space, right? So I'm just you know trying to design a building or interactively model a building or structures or shapes. So we want to connect them to two D images. I want to do everything not only you know, assuming we already have a roughly a pretty good three D geometry, I just want to do interactive modeling of the three D geometry, but we want to connect that to raw visual observations like two D images. So recently there has been some interesting work on um, program synthesis, you know, inferring or synthesizing these programs from visual data and for visual data. So for example, in this paper from Kevin Ellis et al, uh, in New York 2018, they say, okay, we observe the image and then, okay, apparently there are some structures, right? But it's not as straightforward because, you know, the, the, the lines are not that completely straight. Uh, so can I actually first use a neural network, you know, to find the entry level primitives like lines and rectangles and then I can apply, now I'm trying to, you know, in some sense you can say this, like uh, you're, you're vectorizing it. And then you have this uh, vectorized representations. So you're like, okay, I have lines and rectangles. I just do learning based program synthesis to synthesize what are the possible programs that explains these primitives. And then you can easily use that for extrapolation, right? You can change, you know, just a single parameter from three to five and you will be able to uh, extrapolate the scene. And later, uh, together with Daniel Ricci and others, uh, we also try to say, okay, can we ex extend that not only to from 2D line joints, but to simple 3D scenes, like uh, clever like scenes, right? You have images of multiple geometric primitives. So instead of detecting lines and rectangles, can we detect entry level objects like spheres? And then, you know, inferring your program, use that for image editing. Uh, if you have a, you know, a pick to pick like model, you can even try to do it, apply it on some simple real images. But all these methods, right, the 2D line drawing one and the 3D primitive one, they're very limited. I would say extremely limited because they're, they're, they assume you live in this such a contrived world, right? Objects are just lines and rectangles and you have, you know, our 3D objects as spheres and cylinders, but that's not how it works, right? This is not a real world we live in. Um, so can we actually really generalize to natural images like this one? Uh, still a little bit contrived, but at least this is something that you can imagine you might see in the real world. Uh, like a milk with cereal. And you know, again, there is clear repetitive or program-like structures uh, in this image, but are we able to extrapolate or edit images like this using program-like representations? 
And our key idea is to you know, try to connect that using the strong recognition power of neural networks, especially uh, using ideas from you know, single image learning or internal learning. Uh, so for people who are interested, uh, there are, there's like, this is like a classic work on internal learning, learning from a single image, where the key idea is just from a single image, we can actually get a lot of structures because patches or objects in the image are very likely to repeat themselves in a single image. Such kind of a repetition can happen not only in the same scale, like the top of the roof, but also at different scales, right? Because of perspective, because there is 3D, 2D projection, uh, objects may be repeating themselves, but also at different scales. And then, you know, people have tried to exploit this idea, but connect them with deep networks. I know that this one is like a pre-deep network, but people have to try to connect it with deep networks and say, if I'm given images like this, uh, which, you know, there are some repetitive structures, how can I really extract these repeating objects. An idea is to use recognition power of deep networks like AlexNet, then instead of directly computing, comparing local patches and objects on pixels, which can be you know, very, subject, uh, very sensitive and subject to noises or texture variations or lighting variations, what if you just try to find repetitive patterns by in the activations of AlexNet or neural networks learn to you know, capture the in more invariant features of the images. So here they say, okay, if I just try to, you know, compare uh, repetitive uh, activations in like the second convolutional layer or the third convolutional layer, and just try to find what are the offsets that if we translate these feature maps by a certain offset, they're most likely to repeat themselves. They're most likely to repeating, yeah. Uh, to the, the patterns are most likely to be the same after the translation. You can use that to actually find objects or repetitive objects that are, you know, hopefully be more invariant to input noises. So we exploit this idea. We're saying, okay, now why don't we just apply this on images like this? And then you can actually discover, you know, what are the entry level primitives or objects like serials. So you are growing beyond lines, rectangles, or spheres and cylinders, but now you can actually recover or find repetitive objects in real life. And after that, it's kind of pretty straightforward, right? So you have this, uh, you know, centroids of the objects, you can do a program synthesis, but then you can connect them, connect these higher level abstract programs with you know lower level neural networks not only for recognition but what about for synthesis right if i have a patch that is missing in an Im image like this then i have such a strong prior that it must be a cross right because it is like all these cross on this regular regular grid and um i can you know infer what these repetitive objects are and since that's a program for it so i was like i would know okay to paint such a pattern uh like a missing region what are the other patches i should look at Right. I should be able to smartly find the other nearest neighbors uh, uh, by using this program like representations. And then I can send them into a neural network, but here not for recognition, but easily for you know, like this unit structure for imaging painting. And this is what we can get, right? Going from a corrupted, corrupted image to an unpainted image, where the unpainted cross is not identical to any of the other crosses. So you're not just smartly retrieving a nearest neighbor, but you're you're actually smartly blending multiple nearest neighbors to make the output to be realistic. You can do that for not only in painting, but also using the program like representations for extrapolation, adding a new row of the object, or uh, chain to make the image more irregular. Because so, the program actually also captures how, ra how regular uh, the scene is. So if I want to you know, just make these crosses a little bit more irregular, you can also do that. The same for the serial example. Again, you can do imaging painting. Uh, if I'm, you know, one zero is missing, I have a strong prior, there should be one more zero instead of milk. So I can use my program representation to guide my in-painting process or for extrapolation, adding another column of the, of the serial or again for regularity editing as well. Some more results, uh, you know, going from uh, corrupted images um, to uh, in-paint, this is like the zoomed in, zoom, zoomed in version uh, patch of the missing in-painted region. And you can compare that with the ground truth. Uh, it's actually doing quite, I think a pretty reasonable job and compare with all these in you know, a number of baselines. Then especially uh, for deep network learned, uh, deep network based baselines, it's very likely that they're doing very well in blending images to make it look, you know, locally smooth and nice, but they often fail to capture these kind of higher level program like structures uh, compared with uh, our program based uh, representations. Uh, on the other hand, you know, earlier work prior to deep learning, like patch maps, those patch based methods, they may actually do better in cases like this. But still, you know, then they might have, you know, all these uh, artifacts. Well, if you combine the program like representations with deep networks for in painting, then you hopefully, ideally, you get the best of both worlds. 
Finally, uh, everything here is on a single plane, right? So again, we want to go into the 3D world. So for a 3D scene like this, you, you notice there are program like repetitive patterns, procedures, not only in a single plane, but you actually want to really generalize it to multiple planes, right? There's rep repetitions on the seatings, on the walls, on and everything. So uh, we also tried to generalize our program like representations for what we call it like a box-like shapes for multiple planes. So the program now looks like you first have a camera parameters. You want to set what the camera is. And then for every plane, you want to set you know, the plane parameters like surface normals, as well as what is the repetitive uh, structure or programs for each plane. Of course, this now becomes a much harder problem, right? So um, how can we do that? Now, just like in 2D images, we're like, okay, we can, if you have an image of a line drawing, then the low level primitives are lines and rectangles. In 3D, it may become, you know, uh, spheres and cylinders. For natural images, it's like recurrent patterns or repetitive patterns or activations in your network activations. In 3D, on a, the low level cues we try to exploit are vanishing point and 3D wireframes. Both, I think, are paper from each Hao Zhou from UC Berkeley. So we use uh, their, 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 their work as for, for feature extraction. So here, the bottom of visual cues for problem synthesis, just like you have line shapes for line joints, you have re re repeated objects for single plane images, and for multiple planes, you have a vanishing point and wireframes, right? So you want to go in extracting those low level cues, and then you want to do program synthesis. But here, uh, this problem becomes a little even harder because you can see that the wireframes are just much, much more noisy, right? Estimating 3D wireframes is much a harder problem than estimating a line or a sphere or a cylinder. Um, so the output of these like line joints can actually be very noisy and it will be hard to directly estimate what are the planes from these line joints. So our idea is you can not only go in from bottom, you're going from going the bottom up direction, going from images to wireframes to 3D programs. Instead, there should also be a top down process. The program can help you selecting what are the right bottom up visual cues, right? You can go in from the wireframes to generate, come up with a few candidates, right? How I should partition uh, the, the scene or the image into multiple planes. And some are more accurate than others. And then you can, you know, put them, you can do rectification and project them back in 3D. But to tell which one is actually correct or which one's better, we can run program synthesis. And we can try to infer, okay, if I assume my partition based on low-level cues like 3D wireframes are correct, then uh, what, what would the program be like? And the idea is, you know, because we build a world, or we build not a world, we build the buildings or corridors, uh, humans build it, right? So we have this man-made prior that, okay, the, the, the corridor is most likely to be rectangular, it has these box-like shapes. So only if you partition the scene correctly, your infer program will be accurate, and your program should be able to explain the partition much better. So in this case, uh, it's pretty clear that the middle one, right? The second partition, uh, after you rectify the planes and you try to do program synthesis on each plane, uh, the output program best capture the structures or in each plane. While the first and third, they just don't do as well. So then, you know, the plane partition, the bottom up process and the program synthesis, the top down process to really help each other. And we can use the guidance from the programs to help us to do better low level tasks like scene partition or plane partition. And so putting them together, you are going from these low level cues like 3D wireframes to partition the scene and plane. And then for each plane, you want to estimate a program for you know, explaining what is happening in that plane and use it for image manipulation, like editing, in painting, extrapolation. And one direct application is for view synthesis, right? I'm, I'm, I'm in this corridor and what if I walk forward, how did it look like? Then instead of just you know, purely trying to do super resolution on a pixel plane, you know, like using this SingSing framework uh, from Facebook, uh, our program-like representations allows you to you know, easily inf imagine how you, it would be like to walk in an infinite corridor. But again, I want to clarify, I should, I should say, uh, the SingSing framework is much more general, right? So we, have, we are making our assumption that the world we're living in like a box and the box has this repetitive structure. So by making such a, I would say still pretty strong assumption, we can indeed do better in cases that satisfy our assumption. But on the other hand, uh, uh, for, for in the wild general scenes, which may not satisfy this structure, then our system will just fail, right? But at least in the, these kind of more like specialized cases, we can do much better compared with the more general baseline. And another example is how it will look like, you know, if I turn the camera to, to top left, Right, you can synthesize, okay, there should be another light coming in because the lights are repeating themselves, right? 
instead of just you know painting something that's kind of more like blurry, I can also walk backward, right? So how would it seem look like if I walk backward, the lights just, just keep appearing because uh, there's this repetitive structure or how it would look like if I turn around, right? There should be another infinite corridor behind you. Again, no corridors can be really infinite, but this will be a, a plausible assumption or at least in this, in this uh, scenario to imagine how the scene will look like. And you can use that for extrapolation as well, right? Going from a image of a building like this, if I want to make it taller, you can capture the repetitive structure, but you also capture you know, the plane program, the normal of the plane, so that you can in-paint the scene, in-paint the image for each plane, but putting it back to form the building. So you can make the building taller, and these are the baselines, which you can say they're more or less doing something, but they also have you know, all those different kind, kinds of artifacts that you don't want to see. And this is the output of our method. Okay, uh, to summarize, so we have, we have exploited uh, how we may use intermediate representations like surfaces or the notion of objects and going even further to programs or procedures to help us to connect learning systems with you know, these domain knowledge from computer graphics for inversions, geometry estimation, program synthesis, but also for top-down direction, for uh, synthesizing novel shapes, for image editing, for scene manipulation. And I think the key idea here is we want to use neural networks that are extremely powerful in approximating arbitrarily fu uh, complex function uh, for recognition and also you know, for capturing the low level texture details. But with domain knowledge, uh, that, such as surfaces, objects, and procedures for better generalization, for making the learning problem easier, and for reducing the burden on getting high quality training data. But we should really be very careful here because you know, uh, we have learned from history that if we try to build too much things into our domain knowledge into system, I think it's very controversial. And we have learned that it, will, it can actually hurt you by making a system less generalizable because you're assuming too much and these things don't generally hold in the wild. But again, as vision researchers, we're, we're studying vision problem of computer vision. So maybe we want to think about what's the minimal structure or prior knowledge that we can build in, but those minimal structure or prior knowledge are also universal. But what are universal, what is the universal knowledge? Is, you know, the world is, you know, the graphics are trying to approximate those universal knowledge, right? The world is made of objects, objects have surfaces. Every image you see is a 2D projection projected from the 3D world. So 2D, 3D, 3D, 2D, 2D projection, notion of objects, notion of surfaces. Because we made these objects, objects are symmetric, they have repetitive structures. So these are probably the most universal structure that exists everywhere. So we're hoping that building these, you know, universal, but also minimal domain knowledge together with learning systems can actually factorize the problem into minimal learnable unit that help to make your system better, more efficient, more generalizable. So the takeaway is we want to think about what is the causal structure behind visual data, right? Why am I seeing this pixel? Because there are objects, surfaces, projections, and you know, repetitive structures and symmetries. Try to model whatever we can and using learning to learn what we cannot really model. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jiajun, for the for the wonderful talk. So, uh, so the talk is followed by the Q and the A. Um, so the talk will be followed by Q and A. So let's uh, start with a question from the audience. Then we'll have a discussion among the panel uh, panelists. Okay, so one question is that uh, so you talked about the spherical map as a data representation, right? So. So isn't the spherical map representation very sensitive to the way the object's centered? So the question uh, continues, I can imagine self-occlusions being very different depending on how you center the objects, even making most array like hit nothing. Yeah, I agree. Uh, that's true. Um, so as I think it's sometimes a limitation of the work. And also uh, we, we assume the object is always centered and we try to, you know, um, yeah, we assume the object is centered and it is indeed quite sensitive to how objects are centered. And so, so to com to com if we want to do that, apply it to, you know, scenes with multiple objects, I think there will be a lot of challenge. Um, so that's why in the later work, uh, we, we are actually like concurrent work. We didn't really use the uh, spherical map representations for uh, understanding, uh, reconstructing object geometries in scenes. Yeah, so th that, that is true. And self occlusion is very complicated too. So especially for objects that may made that have a lot of like concave structures, uh, you have pretty strong self occlusion. Um, so that's why it could it, you know, the system probably works better for airplanes and cars, uh, which doesn't have that much self occlusion, but works less well 
for furniture and stuff, yeah. or for humans or horses, right? Okay, thanks, Georgine. Now we open uh, the question from the panelists. Do you have anything to ask? Uh, okay, so yeah, so related to that work, I also have a question. Um, so, what do you think uh, is the uh, <laughs> is the intuition behind why once you start to use spherical representation, it's able to generalize to new object categories? Uh, well, I, I can think, imagine that spherical the... representation is really good for modeling details, but why it also provides better uh, generalization? Uh, I think uh, I should clarify that, you know, if you look at this model, what really makes the system generalize better is not spherical map. The spherical map only gives you better details. But mm -hmm. what is important for make the system generalize is you building this back projection module. So instead of having the system learning how back projection works for objects in general, which in that case, it will only learn how it works for training object categories, you're putting the, you, you're building the structure that is, I'm giving the depth map, I just differentially back project it into a 3D visible surface. And this is the part really make the system generalize to new object classes. It's not a spherical map. I see. So for the, for the project, the, the earlier project that you use steps map, that also has this back projection uh, step, or it doesn't use this step? Uh, you mean the two stage, the thing, the thing we yeah. did with EFI with that? No, that doesn't have it. So that doesn't generalize. Yeah. Ah, I see. Okay, cool. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Sid, how are you? Great, hi. Uh, thanks for the wonderful work. Uh, I had a sort of follow-up question to Shuran, just sort of broadening the perspective a little bit more. Uh, so you, you mentioned the role of, uh, for example, a deterministic projection operator to avoid over-parameterization in, let's call it the sort of decoder uh, module. Uh, but I, I'm just sort of wondering, uh, as a broad um, question, how you think about avoiding over-parameterization with lower dimensional representations at various stages. For example, your, uh, the, the fact that you predict a shape program rather than, or the fact that you use a shape program as a prior is one way of getting around that, right? It's not just for uh, generalization or for imposing a strong prior for, which, which matches human observations. It's also that the shape program can be a much lower dimensional representation and that itself solves the problem of over, over parameterization. So I'm wondering what, you, what your perspective is on uh, using structural representations in general, for example, representing uh, chairs as you know, a combination of uh, roughly cuboidal parts to make a gross oversimplification. And predicting in that space rather than predicting directly even to you know, spherical maps or 2.5D images or whatever. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. Actually, I was, you know, uh, this semester, this quarter, I'm co-teaching a course on AI with graphics. And yesterday, I just you know try to talk about a little bit about. I basically give a a, a bridge version of our tutorial, so so the uh, learning CD structure tutorial. I think it's you know Daniel has this nice slide which showing you can think about structure or seeing your geometry as a factorization of various like element element primitives like you know what is the is there be a, 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 for the chairs it may have the leg as a, as a cuboid but also there's element structure which you can you know represent it as or the most general is probably programs but also harder to get annotations for but also like hierarchical graphs all those things like you know parse sets all those different representations. And I think, interestingly, there seems to be a trend, I think more or less, that people are converging into. That is, you know, uh, you try to discover the structure or the template, which could be object or category specific. Like, you know, chairs always have a back, has a bottom, or has, or, or humans always have, you know, bodies and arms. But then for the element primitive, right, how, how, the, how the chair lag should look like, or going into this, I would say, uh, the program representation, um, you know, the program representation is nice in the sense that you can easily extrapolate or you can capture, you know, chairs has a top and bottom. But it, if you look at the fine details, right, every chair lag is different. So if you just try to re approximate it with a cuboid, it, it usually doesn't give you very good results. So people have thought, okay, what if I just can, you know, have this more structured or template like representations for object categories, but I have a learned more local, you know, representations like local implicit functions for what a chair lag should look like. Right, Tom Funkhauser and Kyle, Kyle Genova, they had a paper I see here 2020, like local deep implicit functions, which is, I think, in some sense, aligned with this direction. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I think, I mean, we are very much aligned in this sort of broad perspective. I also like to think of uh, a shape as factorized into its macro structure and its micro geometry. Mm -hmm. And you can have your initial prediction module maybe, you know, project, maybe predicting something 
related to macro geometry, and then conditioned on that, you predict the micro geometry for the individual primitives right. or whatever it is. Right. So I mean, that's one way of doing it. Of course, you could you could jointly predict both at the same time, and right. you know, right. I I don't think we have a good answer for uh, should you do it sequentially or should you do it all in one go. Yeah. But I think the factorization is important, and I mean, it seems that you know you share that view as well. I agree. Okay, so uh, so. So I have one one question to 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 ask. I hope uh, Jordan and also see that Suran can give comments. Is that for them in this uh, like shape reconstruction, right? If we look at the input images, uh, most of them are product images, right? So, but uh, from the computer vision perspective, how far are we uh, in terms of generalizing those images to, for example, like in a, in an indoor environment, noisy indoor environment? That I take a uh, take a uh, photo, right? So of uh, of uh, of a chair, for example. So, do you think like uh, we are very close to that, or there's something that we need to uh, work more? Hmm. Um, Shishi, I'm not sure if I fully understand it because yes, you know, I'm just saying like for example, well, if we yeah, look at this slide, right? So so this is I call the product image, right? So the background is relatively simple, uh, but if we like thinking about the chair, like our grass, right? Outdoor, with a with them with a person, like. Mm -hmm. um, so how far are we like in terms of solving those kind of problems? I'll I, I say there are uh, two levels. So one is you know so yeah sure this picture is synthetic and it's uh, yeah. you know a clean background, but also we do have data sets that are you know more noisy and you know you know like chairs in indoor environments. You know I, the pic three D I think people could try it. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's how do you reconstruct shares in all those, you know, also a lot of internet images and indoor scenes. And I, I do feel like people are making a lot of progress in that kind, in that level, you know, especially, you know, Georgia, right? She, she presented, I think last time, they had all these works on simultaneously detecting objects and also inferring their 3D geometry like in meshes. Mm -hmm. um, but there's another level that is more in the wild. That is, you know, what if, you know, chairs, what, what does it really might mean by a chair? A chair is something you can sit on or even just like regular chairs, but you can put them in weird positions or in the wild or not in this common indoor sea environments. And I, I feel like to really understand, you know, to reconstruct chairs in those kinds of most in the wild cases, we're probably not there yet. Um, yeah, but that's that's my take on it. Um, yeah, so maybe I should make this question more more specific is that is do, do you think like we have the technology, like we know how to build an architecture uh, all, uh, and it's really a matter of whether we have the right data set to train those things, or, or you think that we also have to, you know, because in your talk, you talked about a lot of uh, 3D priors, right? So this kind of domain knowledge, they're very useful for inferring 3D geometry, right? Do you think like from, from the technology perspective, we are already there, it's just like we don't have the data set, or to solve those more, more challenging problems, you also need to advance both, right? Both the data set and the and the technology. So that. Mm, I think, I think my answer will be, if we do can get a lot of high quality data for objects like chairs, um, in, in the wild, and then I do feel like it is a problem with data. But the, this is a problem of data in the sense that it's impossible to get that kind of data. So then in turn, it becomes a problem of technology. Because yeah. if, we, if we live in this ideal world that we have infinite money and infinite you know, human power, then we can just scan or cre you know, create all those high quality that get whatever data we want, no matter how complex, how expensive, how many they are. Then I do feel like, you know, all those like some kind of very impressive methods on, especially those increasing function base was reconstructing from an image, combining with some like 2D segmentation, which is also something that you can do really well if you have a lot of data then it, it, I don't feel we will not be able to solve this problem. But collecting such data is impossible. So then, you know, and probably never possible in the next 10, 20, 30 years, then that becomes a technology problem because we, how can we really uh, solve this problem with only limited and low quality data? Um, then that becomes a technology problem. That's my, my, my view. Okay, I want to hear some, uh, some comments from Sudan. Yes. Uh, yeah, and I, I have a, <laughs> Exactly weird answer that you probably didn't expect uh, is that if you think about the so if the task is for example just trying to estimate the 3D geometry from images, then 
I think it's definitely a solvable problem. I, actually, we already solved it with uh, multi-view city reconstruction. Um, so if you don't constrain your problem with single view, if you can move your camera, if you can capture multiple uh, images, then we can we have a solution to, to get that. Uh, so maybe the technology, apart from like the training data and the learning method, is also kind of a part of the hardware that we can consider to use better cameras that directly give us th those kind of 3D geometry. Um, so yeah, so that's my answer. Okay, so that's, so that's thanks, Georgine. So C, do you have any comment on this? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, you, you know, you, you open a can of worms there. I think it's, it's a huge topic to, we, had, we, could, we could spend the rest of this discussion talking about it. I think I'll just address one small thing, which, which is related to what Shuran said, uh, which is that, I mean, uh, it's arguable that our community has a sort of unfair focus on single images, uh, which is not to say that, you know, all the single image reconstruction work isn't tremendously cool. But there are other modalities for capture. The most obvious one, which we don't even need special hardware for is video. So, uh, you know, what do these, uh, you know, we do so much work on getting the geometry, uh, the, the geometry processing pipeline right, whether through data-driven methods or through classical deterministic methods. But uh, if we just assume that our input uh, is, a, you know, a short video with some temporal consistency between the frames, and how do those pipelines adapt, how, and, and what does the output look like? Um, I, mean, I, I can't say anything more authoritative than this because I've done no work on this at all. But you know, following up on what Shuran said, I mean, it seems like you know we don't even need to have new hardware because people are capturing videos all the time. A uh, self-driving car is capturing video all the time. What sort? What does? Uh, you know, what do these uh, complex shape priors that all of us are working on uh, look like when they are applied to reconstructing from a few frames rather than one frame? Okay. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, thanks, Sid. Okay. So let's move to another topic, which is somehow, right? So we have, uh, so if you think about like uh, shapes and scenes, right? Scenes meaning uh, collections of, uh, of, uh, of objects, right? So, uh, so what is really the difference here? Like for, like, for example, do you think uh, uh, all those approaches that right, they can or all the all the relevant ones, okay? They generalize easily to scenes, so assuming that we we have this kind of uh, nice representation of three scenes, right? So do you think? So what are really the fundamental challenges between like uh, in shapes and three D scenes? Uh, Shitting. Uh, sorry, just just a, a, a like a clarification. Do you mean for uh, reconstruction specifically, or do, do for... For, for, for reconstruction, right? For reconstruction, yeah. Okay. For a single image. So maybe you should, we should start with Suan. You 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 are expert. You 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 know this, right? So well, I I guess the obvious answer is that uh, since it's a collection of a lot of objects, so you can easily say that it's more complex because you have more objects. Uh, you have uh, inter-object occlusions, so uh, naturally it's harder. But also maybe some you can argue the other way is that things are easier because you have a lot of priors that you can apply. So I, I think the last uh, project that uh, Jajun presents is on things, but you can actually apply it the structural priors of the env uh, indoor environment. Like you can apply the Manhattan assumption so that a lot large portion of the environment you already get it because it's planar surface. So uh, yeah, I guess that's like the most obvious answers. Um, Okay, seed. So you work on scene generation, right? So what is your comment on this? Yeah, I, I think they are different. So I, I can't speak much for reconstruction. You know, Shuran, Jiajun, uh, Peter, you are you're the experts on the reconstruction aspect of things. But I can talk a little bit about the generation side of things. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, we all agree that scenes are collections of objects. And the uh, in, uh, and similarly shapes are collections of parts. So there's this uh, connection between the two that in both cases, you're trying to model some distribution over a space of graphs. The nodes are your atomic elements and the edges or hyper edges are relationships between them. Uh, but I think the difference is in what these uh, relationships are and that makes these problems very different. Uh, so partly you can solve this with domain knowledge. Uh, or you can address this with domain, domain knowledge. Solve is a strong word. Uh, and you can explicitly say that these are the relationships that characterize scenes. I mean, they could be, um, you know, things like uh, chairs are placed in front of tables and so on and so forth. But, but it's not really like the connectivity structure where, where individual parts come together to make a shape. Um, and, and partly you can try to learn these automatically. Uh, 
uh, using some very general learning framework. We tried this a little bit with, let's say, recursive networks. But uh, the kernels that these recursive networks learn are different in the two cases. And we found that uh, in our uh, experiments, at least, we couldn't just uh, apply the single shape processing pipeline as is to scenes because those relationships were different. So we had to explicitly inject some domain knowledge. We had to explicitly engineer some aspects of those kernels and the training data in order to capture these diff different relationships. Uh, we, we can you know, take this discussion towards talking about you know, what the salient relationships are in scenes and uh, how they differ from the relationships between at atomic elements found in single shapes, but uh, that, that might be a, you know, a bit too much of a digression. Okay, point. thanks, Seed. Thanks, Seed. Yeah, I think the, problem, the difference That's is mainly in the relationships. Okay, thanks, Seed. Now, let's move back to Jadrin. Do you have uh, any comments? On... Well, I don't have my own comment, but I have a comment that I learned from the slide. <laughs> Maybe Sid made. I think it's probably Richard, Richard Jiang from Simon Fraser. He made. That is, he said something that's pretty similar to Sid, you said. But another point, in addition to the relationship, also a difference is in, the, in alignment. Right? I think uh, shape that or all the single image become very popular is because they align the shapes, right? All the car, all the chairs are in a canonical pose. So, so when you do a reconstruction, we, we have, you know, uh, I guess a major reason that people are overfitting doing nearest neighbor tool is because if you do a reconstruction in a canonical space in ob object centered coordinates, it's just so much easier. And objects, the quality is pretty good. But this problem is, but then here people have learned you know, to, to make it more generalizable, you have to reconstruct in a viewer centered coordinate. You cannot really assume objects can be perfectly aligned. And naturally, for scenes, there seems no very straightforward ways to learn this canonical, you know, normalized coordinates for scenes. You can say that you, know, you try to put it like upright or whatever, but there's no clear definition of what is the orientation of the scene. And, and I, I think uh, beyond that, you can make this sort of, because, because Jordan mentioned the viewer centric uh, aspect of things. I, I think you can make the point that, you know, these differences can all be encapsulated in the way that humans interact with single shapes and with scenes differently. So scenes are laid out in ways typically that humans can interact with them and single shapes are laid out in ways so that humans can sort of pick up and interact with them. So in one case, it's, let's say the hands uh, doing the, interaction for a chair, for example, or a single, the body doing the interaction in one place, whereas for a scene, the human moves around. So at the end, the differences are mediated by this human prior. And to make this concrete, this has been exploited in vision where there are uh, you know, hallucinated humans, for example, uh, there's work from Cornell uh, and I think Stanford uh, on this, uh, to use these human priors for uh, scene recognition or object detection in scenes. And uh, there's been some work on using the human prior for uh, shape recognition and shape synthesis as well. So, you know, maybe that's where we should look in order to characterize these differences. Uh, okay, do you have more uh, additional questions for, for the speaker or is there anything well, you want to uh, well, I have Chishin, what do you think? You never answer any of these questions. Yeah. Oh well. Okay. So my my question, I think I, I think pretty much uh, you you have uh, summarized, right? I think uh, uh, there's some similarity between between uh, shapes and the 3D scenes, right? So I think, but on the other hand, the the differences in ter in terms of like the semantics, right? So because the way how objects interact uh, could be different by, uh, from how how, how parts interact, right? So with them, shapes have uh, a lot of uh, symmetry structures, right? So rotational symmetry structures among the parts uh, and uh, this will be fractional symmetry, right? So those kind of structures that tend to, we, we see less, right, in 3D scenes. Um, and another thing I think uh, uh, is that how, how, how humans, right, so interact with the shapes and the humans interact with the, is the scene, right? So I would like to actually hear something also from Suran about this. Yeah. this is good actually, while we are discussing it, I was I was actually start to think that maybe the object and the scene is not that different. Uh, so why I'm saying that, uh, especially in the context of reconstruction, like the traditional reconstruction algorithm, it works for both objects and, and, the, uh, and um, the environment just running the same algorithm. Maybe you need to change the baseline 
a little bit so that you can see different depths, but the same algorithm works. Uh, I think the only when we the only difference is that once we in, start to inject priors or um, semantic information in our pipeline, then they start to have a difference. Uh, so on, on the low level uh, 3D geometry perspective, maybe there is not a huge difference. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think, I think uh, certainly um, uh, data, from the data perspective, right? So uh, the same data sets um, are challenging to collect, right? Because the, the cost is higher. I think the, from the data perspective, we have, um, right, if we think about the real data set, right? So we have smaller same data sets compared to, to the, uh, to the uh, real ones. Okay, uh, to the of the three D shapes, so those I think I think I think there are similarities, but there are also challenges, right? differences. Okay. okay, so do we have more questions? If not, let's uh, actually I have a question for okay. uh, Jiajun, if I may. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, following up on the discussion we've been having, did you try uh, shape programs for the scenes? Um, good question. Um, did we try it? No, the street uh, we view, haven't tried it. Yeah. So the street view example kind of kind of like Yeah, that's yeah, that, I guess that's the only effort that we tried in our scenes, you know, the multiple planes. So see, you know, I, I, is that scene, I, I guess it's kind of an intermediate. So so you assume there's a box. So in that sense, you're turning a scene into an object, uh, but not on general scenes yet. Yeah. So what what would be the challenges? Well, I guess partially is also just like, you know, I said, when we're going from an object, uh, reconstructing geometry to image editing, there are a lot of things that are not really objects, like tree, well, depending on what you mean by object, but skies and roads and, and, and trees, or these are things that it's probably much better, you know, explained by a latent vector or directly in 2D. So the same as for in the wild scenes as well, where, although there are a lot of repetitive and interesting structures in, in, a, in the man-made objects in the, in, a, in the wild picture, but there are also other things that probably be much better explained by a lower level or more latent implicit representations. So how to integrate such kind of very strong, I would say explicit representations like programs with extremely strong priors with those implicit representations for things that are not as well structured might be a, a challenge. Thanks. Okay, so maybe next. Thanks to the speaker Georgine for the wonderful talk. Thanks for C and Sudan for for the nice discussions and thanks for all. Okay, thank you. And Jason. see you thank next. You.